evening, everyone. And uh, between um, the World Series and Barack's campaign commercial, I didn't think anyone would be here today. <laughs> Sports, politics, and religion is a distant third. So uh, welcome back and um, to our fifth week. And uh, this is uh, our six-week series. I noticed today, I looked at some of the handouts we've been giving you during this last week. And uh, last, last week, I think, there was a handout that said um, uh, fourth of a five-week series, I think it said on top. And, um, and uh, that's because this used to be a five-week series. But uh, now we do the improved version. <laughs> that's six weeks. But we forgot to change the handout. So uh, some of you, maybe that's why some people are confused how long it is. But we have one more week after today. And um, the uh, added week is today. So this is the special week. Um, I didn't used to teach this topic as part of the intro class, but um, I was inspired about a year and a half ago that uh, this, is, this is a very important, uh, significant, very significant uh, aspect of mindfulness practice that I thought would benefit a lot at this introductory class. Uh, before I start, uh, do any of you have any questions you'd like to ask? <clears throat> Comments? Reports about your meditation at home or anything that's related here. It's all straightforward. <laughs> Ever since last week, you haven't had a single thought. <laughs> okay. Um, So the topic for today <clears throat> is mindfulness of the mind. And as an introduction to the topic, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, tell you a Buddhist story, kind of a Buddhist fable from the time of the Buddha. Um, in uh, traditional Indian and Buddhist mm, worldview or cosmology or mythology, there's a god in uh, kind of one of the great gods of the heavenly realms named Brahma. And he rules over the whole, his, his, his heavenly realm. And, um, <clears throat> and one day, a yakka, a uh, yaksha, a yaksha uh, was, was kind of like a mischievous tree spirit. And um, an ugly little runt of a yaksha like an ugly little runt of a troll. Um, came and sat on Brahma's throne. Like this is the great god, right? The great, in the Indian pantheon, there's like no bigger god. It's not like the great greater god, but he's like a pretty big figure up there. And he went and sat on Brahma's throne. One day when he was away on his travels. And uh, now all the other gods who were around about <clears throat> the court, the royal, the, the heavenly court, uh, thought, that, you know, this is wrong. A little ugly little runt of a yaksha shouldn't be, you know, sitting on the great Brahma's throne. So they got kind of angry and said, you have to get off that throne. And um, as they said that, he started growing bigger and bigger, and they got even more angry because he didn't budge. So they were yelling at him more and more, you got to get off, you know, who are you to sit up there? And, and as they continued with their ranting and raving and fury at him being you know, sitting there where he shouldn't be, he kept getting bigger and bigger and more and more beautiful till he was a beautiful, great, you know, yaksha. And uh, so these uh, court gods were a little confused, so they decided to go ask Brahma what to do or to report it to him. So they went to him and said, There's, there was this ugly little runt of Yaksha who sat on your throne, and we keep telling him to get off, and he doesn't want to get off. Not only that, but he's getting bigger and more beautiful as he sits there. And Brahma said, Oh, okay, I know what to do. So he went back, 
And he stood in front of his own throne and he bowed deeply to the yaksha and he said, oh, it's so nice to see you. I hope you're comfortable up there and you should come visit more often and, you know, my dear friend. And as he said that, the yaksha got smaller and smaller and smaller until finally he got so small that he poofed, he disappeared. At which point Brahma went back up, sat up back on his throne and said, uh, and then turned around and said to his court, he said, that yaksha, that tree spirit, um, is an anger-eating yaksha. If you're angry around it, it feeds on you and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you stop feeding it, then it shrinks and shrinks and eventually will go away. So what you need to do is you have to bring your kindness to it, and the kindness, it'll just, you know, it'll just dissolve away. So an anger-eating yaksha. So do you have your own anger-eating yaksha? You know, what do you, what do you feed? What gets bigger? and more beautiful <laughs> as you get angry. So this uh, fable uh, points to the idea that our relationship to our experience, how we relate to things, uh, has a big impact on on ourselves. So if you um, stay angry, if you get angry with someone, um, if you get angry enough, uh, you don't become beautiful. You, don't go, you might get big you know, in your fury, but generally, it's understood, I think, that when people are really angry, they get kind of ugly. <laughs> you don't, it's not a beauty treatment to get angry. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, it feeds something inside of us. But it doesn't just feed, you know, our, our you know, physicality. It also feeds our, you know, it conditions our mind, our heart. It conditions how we relate to the world. If you get angry a lot, it can color everyone you see and everything you touch. You could be angry with one person, but it just kind of fills you with a mood of anger. And then when you go go walk down the street, everyone irritates you. You know, how could they walk that way? They're stepping on too many cracks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just gets kind of ridiculous sometimes because we're so irritated. And um, so we're feeding something, and sometimes we feed not only not only how we are in the moment, but sometimes we're feeding a habit, and that habit develops over time. Um, there are other ha- other habits to feed, other states to feed. So if you're kind, uh, that's your disposition and default. Uh, if you're feeling kind of relaxed and generous, then you can go through the, down the street and you, that attitude affects how you see people. The attitude affects how you see yourself. So not only can you be kind in a moment to a particular person or loving to a particular person, but it also affects your mood and how you are and that how you are then affects how you see the world around you. Um, and also it affects the habits get formed, the, how you condition your mind. So in Buddhism, there's an emphasis on taking responsibility not only for your choices in the moment, but also for um, how those choices shape your overall state of being, your state of mind, your mood, your overall attitude that you have about uh, your life as you go through it. And not only the overall mood for the day or for the hour, but also the the predisposition you have to fall back into certain states or attitudes of mind. So if you um, you develop a habit, if you always go around being angry, then you're more likely to fall into that. It's really easy to to fall into that groove some other time. If you're always being afraid or anxious, not only maybe are you anxious of a particular thing, but it could affect your overall attitude towards everything in that moment or that hour. If you're kind of anxious about everything, um, and like right now, it seems like a lot of people. See, my impression is in the last two weeks, I feel that there's a lot more anxiety in people, and it, some of the anxiety is you know, they'll say even that they're anxious about the economy and work and all that, but it's it's spilling out and expressing itself in all kinds of other ways in their life. And sometimes they're not even sure what they're anxious about anymore. It's just kind of underlying feeling of anxiety. And um, so it can, you know, get anxious about a particular thing. It can affect the whole mood. But it also then can affect how we get shaped into the future, the, how we're conditioned, or how we tend to be more disposed to habits that get formed. And so then if you keep reinforcing the, um, the fear and living from there, you're more likely to fall into those patterns in the future as well. So in, Buddha, in Buddhist practice, then, mindfulness has a role in all three of these realms. Mindfulness has a role by putting us in the present moment, 
and being relaxed enough in the present moment, calm enough in the present moment, to see the impulses that arise in us, to see the motivations, to see what we want to say, what we want to do, what we want to think, and to track it enough, to be present enough for it, and say, wait a minute, I don't have to act on that. You know, I have a choice here. If we don't slow down enough, if we don't have a strong enough mindfulness, we don't see we have any choice. So if you're walking down the street and you walk by an ice cream parlor and the next thing you know you're holding an ice cream cone in your hand, (laughs) you know, well, (laughs) where was the choice? You know, all I knew I was walking on the street and then I had this ice cream, you know, there wasn't, you know, know, I I didn't choose that. and, uh, but of course you chose it, but maybe there wasn't enough mindfulness and perhaps maybe there was a, the, the powers of desire were so strong that you know, they just took over and you kind of were in a st- trance when that happened. It can happen uh, much more uh, clearly with um, anger. Uh, people can say things um, very spontaneously in, in anger that they would never in their right mind would ever, ever do if they thought about it, but they're so worked up or so triggered that it, it comes out of their, their mouth, sometimes comes out of their hand um, as they hit someone or someone. Um, so, so in that kind of situation, you don't see choice. And there's a phenomenal, um, uh, a lot of people in our society who don't see the ch- choices they make because they don't see how the choices, they don't see the places of choice. If you don't see where you have choice, you have no choice. If you see the place of choice, you have choice. So mindfulness practice expands the range of places that you have choice where you can choose in your life. And so things aren't such a mystery why you're down the street holding an ice cream parlor or why something happens to you. So mindfulness helps you put you in the place of choice. And that helps you with wiser choices in the present moment. It also, as you choose to behave and act and even think in different ways, it also can have an effect on your overall mood and attitude with which you approach your life, what goes on. And as you begin exercising that choice, it also can have a profound effect on how you uh, condition yourself, how you predispose yourself uh, as you go forward into your life, into the future. So um, mindfulness has you know, affects all of these. For today, the topic is mindfulness. Uh, Buddhist, in Buddhist terminology, it's called mindfulness of mind. And uh, in maybe in English, uh, we would maybe say more like um, uh, mindfulness of our attitude, mindfulness of the overall mood or overall state that we're in. So again, I, I'm sorry I'm picking on anger today so much, um, but maybe the ir- irritating for me to see you. I keep talking about anger. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, you know, if you're walking down the street and you see someone walking towards you who's really angry. You can almost see the steam coming from them. You know, kind of feel the mood, the grumpiness. Wow, you, know, you just kind of see it from from afar. Or you see someone who's really carefree and happy and delighted, and you kind of feel that that kind of aura, not aura, but the kind of mood or kind of atmosphere of that person almost. You just kind of can feel it in how they are. Um, and um, so the mindfulness of the mind has to do more with that state of our being, the overall mood or attitude with which we go through life. And um, but that attitude that we have can also be invisible to us, because it's so much part and parcel of the kind of the atmosphere we're in. It's like you can't see the water. This the fish can't see the water it's in, swimming in. Or I like to think of it as like a dirty um, uh, windshield. And you're so focused on driving, and the road that you don't notice. Not only don't you notice the that you're not seeing very clearly because it's so dirty. Uh, but also you don't notice the strain it has on your eyes and yourself to try to see through the dusty windshield. So the attitude can kind of be sometimes that way. You don't notice the effect it has on you. It doesn't You don't notice the effect it has on how you perceive the world around you. The last thing I'll say about this before we meditate is um, to give an analogy I'll say it this way. Um, I think uh, it's, the, it's the nature of being a human being or nature or just comes with being a human being that human beings have problems, right? I mean, do any of you not have any problems? 
problems come along. And, um, and you, you, know, you have one problem and then another problem. And right now I have a car problem. Hopefully in the next week it won't be there. You know, but, you know, but then I'm sure I'll have another problem. You know, something else will come along. And, and um, you know, some, something, some, some difficulty, something that's a little bit of that to take care of. And, um, and if you think of, um, if you give the idea that your problems kind of the, the, the letter X, like equation X, the variable X, the X is what fills that space can change a lot. But the attitude you have, the relationship you have to your problems, that can be kind of constant. Some people have kind of common default attitudes. Every time there's a problem, oh boy, you know, not again, or this is impossible, or I'm not going to pay attention, I'm going to escape, or I'm going to lash out and blame someone, or I'm going to get depressed, or I'm going to, you know, or some, this, this is too much, or oh boy, a problem, I, I love problem solving, it's like a puzzle, <laughs> great, and that's kind of default. You know, so there's X that maybe changes all the time, and then what changes less often is how you might relate to various problems. It's easy to be blinded by the problems to not notice the relationship we have with the problems, the attitude we have towards these things. And some people will have underlying attitude, kind of pervasive attitudes that kind of they carry with them that affects everything that they touch. So the analogy is this. If a fly lands on an ant, it's probably a big deal for the ant. It's, you know, for the ant, it's kind of heavy. It's kind of the same size, maybe bigger than the ant. The ant, you know, can't move around so easily. And, you know, maybe it can't get into his little ant hole because this big thing is stuck on it. And, you know, it's, just, it's a big deal. If the same fly lands on an elephant. Elephant couldn't care less. When you have problems, are you more like the ant or more like the elephant? There are times when you're we're fragile, tense, vulnerable, upset, all kinds of stuff. And the smallest little thing can just kind of push us over, kind of do us in. We're like the ant. And other times when you're happy, contented, energetic, present, full, something, and the same kind of things, you know, just you hardly notice. It's like it's a problem, fly on my back, you know. It's, you know it's, I guess it's a fly there, but maybe I don't have to do anything about it. So the attitude, you know, we can, we can, how we hold ourselves or how we feel about ourselves or how, we, how the mood or the state that we're in can have a big impact on how we relate to our world, how we relate to our problems and our blessings, our fortunate things that happen to us. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a variable that can be adjusted and changed. The mood, the state, the attitude, uh, how we relate to things, how we are in relationship to all things, that's something that's not fixed. And one of the things that mindfulness can do can help us become mindful of not only the overall state that we're in, but also the choices that uh, that uh, that uh, add choices that in, uh, influence the state, the mood, the situation we're in. So last week we talked about mindfulness of thinking, and one of the effects with being preoccupied in thoughts, really preoccupied, caught up in your thinking. If you, if you notice, if you look at next time you're really preoccupied and you'll probably see, feel something like a constricting of awareness, a tightening up of awareness, a narrowing of awareness, a, um, maybe even a, a darkening. The kind of almost like if you look at the feel of the mind, it feels like it's darkening down. Um, when we're not preoccupied and we let go of our preoccupation, there can be a lightening, an opening up feeling, an expansive feeling goes on there. So the state of awareness can be contracted and it can be expansive. And you can, can be aware of whether it's conta- contracted or expansive. And the state of the mind can have a big impact on o- our overall, overall state or our mood. A very expansive mind can give us an expansive sense of being. A contracted mind 
can give us a very contracted sense of being. If you have an expansive sense of being, you can be the elephant. If you have a contracted sense of being, caught up in something, then you can be like the ant. So you following me enough? Okay, so let's meditate with So taking a comfortable, alert posture, gently closing your eyes. And it's helpful, beginning of a sitting, to spend a little bit of time getting into your posture. Maybe swaying back and forth, sideways, wiggling the spine, Perhaps feeling how the weight of your body might move through the spine. And perhaps, especially those of you not using a backrest, maybe they're going to find a way to feel actually the weight of your body travels down the center of your spine. Because in that case, the spine can support the weight instead of the muscles holding you up. In the beginning of a sitting, it can be helpful to take a few long, slow, deep breaths. As you breathe in deeply, to feel the stretching of your rib cage, your shoulders, your belly, almost like a massage from the inside. And as you exhale, to relax. Let go, settle in, deep breath in, long breath out. And then letting your breath return to normal. And take a few moments to scan through your body to see if there's any obvious places of holding or tension that you can either relax or if you can't relax it, let go of the holding. Perhaps you, there can be a softening around it, a lightening up around it. And then within your body, as part of your body, become aware of the body's experience of breathing. Feeling how the body might expand and contract. Parts of the body lift and fall as you breathe, or the sensations of the air coming in and out through the nostrils. And 
letting go the best you can of your thoughts and concerns from the day <clears throat> in order to settle into the experience of breathing as if the breathing is your home base. you notice that you're drifting off in thought, just notice that. Be relaxed about it. Just notice that's happened. Be mindful of that. And then without commentary or judgment, begin again with your breathing. Begin again being aware. Breathing in and breathing out.
But as you're sitting here, what is your overall mood or state? What's the overall general state of being? And there's many things you might notice like that. Are you tired or alert? Do you feel contracted or expanded? Calm or agitated? Fuzzy or clear, crisp? Anxious or relaxed? Interested or bored? Patient or impatient? And being aware of this overall state, how does it affect you? How does it affect how you see what's going on and relate how you relate to it? How are you influenced by the state that you're in? And then as you're mindful of all this, can you shift your identity, shift with what you identify yourself with from your mood or your attitude to the mindfulness, the awareness that knows and recognizes the state you're in?
shifting gears a little bit <clears throat> with whatever you're noticing now, with whatever is happening now. What is your attitude towards that? What is, how are you relating? What's your relationship to what's happening with meditation for you or in your situation you're in now, with the thoughts you have, the feelings you have? What's the relationship or the attitude? for it or against it? Are you liking it or not liking it? Are you enjoying it or are you resisting? Is there wanting or not wanting? What's your attitude to what's happening? might even be your attitude to me question, giving you this question. And then can you shift your identity, shift yourself from kind of being the attitude believing the attitude to being mindful of it. Can you step out away from it and watch it? And then taking a deep breath or two to return more fully to your breathing. And for the last two minutes of this sitting, just staying with your breathing the best you can, not letting yourself be swept away through your attitude, your mood, your state. Stay with your breathing for two minutes.
So I have here in front of me <clears throat> this meditation bell that I just rang here in the here in front of me, and um, it's possible to just focus on that. But it also, it's possible to notice the environment within which this bell is. And our experience of paying attention to the bell could be influenced by the environment that we're in. If, we were, if this room was phenomenally dirty and messy and all the trash was never picked up, and just kind of, you know, you hardly could see it because all the trash everywhere, that would affect the atmosphere of the messy, dirty room <clears throat> would it kind of affect how we kind of experienced the bell in some ways. If you um, <clears throat> if you come in here someday in the med- meditation hall and no one's here, it's very kind of, I think it's quite beautiful. It's kind of kind of peaceful, uh, quiet, expansive kind of room to be in. <clears throat> you see the bell, and it kind of just part of this kind of a little bit exquisite kind of thing, kind of like a single Japanese flower in a Japanese flower arrangement, you know, in a Quiet, empty room. It can be quite exquisite, as opposed to going into, you know, you have to take the same single arrangement, flower arrangement, and you put it, um, you know, you stick it on one of the shelves in the Seven Eleven, uh, you know, grocery store. <laughs> you know, it has a different feeling for that. You know, what it looks like, the atmosphere, the atmosphere or the environment which in which something exists can affect kind of how we relate to something. So the same thing with ourselves. We can focus on the details of our life, the details we can focus on our thoughts, we can focus on our feelings, our body sensations, what's going on in our body. We can focus on uh, you know, our breathing itself. We can focus on the details, but the, the mindfulness of the mind is including within that an awareness of what's the, at, the environment within which these details are occurring. It's very easy for some people to get blinded by the details and not notice the overall atmosphere or the environment that occurs. So mindfulness of the mind has to do with this overall state that we're in. And it can be very uh, uh, helpful to notice that because it has such a big influence on how how we are and the choices we make and how we think. And if we can step out of it, if we can note it, oh, look at that. I am really feeling... Um, you know, uh, shaky today. I'm really vulnerable. You know, I'm just something dramatic happened. And I feel really vulnerable, and so oh, I think I better get to take that into account, as opposed to not noticing the environment of vulnerability, and then kind of stumbling through and wondering why things are so hard. So step at what's the what's going on here? Um, um, do we feel expansive like an elephant? Do we feel teeny, kind of small and insignificant. I've known people who have been quite petite and uh, and in their petiteness they were really big. Their persona, their sense of being was huge, you know. I've known people who actually were quite small, short, um, adults, short adults, and I actually didn't notice they were short because somehow their presence was so big. And then I've known uh, adults who have been really tall and big, and they felt really small. They felt so kind of timid or something. And there's a very small sense of self there. So again, the, again, it has to do with the environment that's there. So a different feeling about what it's like to be alive and be ourselves. So I want to say more about this, but I'd like to hear from you a little bit. Um, so in the meditation now, were you able to kind of step back and kind of get the sense of the overall mood or attitude or state of being that you had? And if so, what did you discover and, and what happened to you when you took that into account, when you could see that and be aware of it? So it would be nice if someone could break the ice. Take the mic here from Jill, please. Um, I found that it was difficult. And one of the things that I found difficult was precision. Um, precision. precision. Um, I found it very easy to sort of identify this is going to sound familiar to you to identify my uh, attitude as 
like positive or negative mm -hmm. like you know like and, and you 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 offered sort of a, a number of options and I found that on, on all of them I was like whatever the bad one was <laughs> <laughs> and and then I sort of realized well I don't really feel those bad things I just sort of you know can I can identify okay I have sort of like a eh, there's a resistance mood. or kind of okay. um but I wouldn't say that I ha I was able to do have all that sort of like precise differentiation uh -huh. in that it was much more just like eh, as opposed to and sometimes I think I know that I feel more like just eh, and it it just those that binary uh -huh. great uh, it's uh, it's um it, it's uh, significant just to know that. To know you have this, I don't know what, what exactly what it was, but some generalized kind of resistance or kind of, you know, kind of grumpiness <laughs> about everything, you know, then, then uh, you can take that in. So, so when, you, when you're aware of that, what, how, how is it different for you to be aware of it versus not being aware of it? And well, then that, I guess that would be another sort of response that I could have, which is that the awareness of it was very pleasant. So it was it was unpleasant. But it the, was unpleasant. But the awareness was pleasant. Fantastic. <laughs> so where would you rather be? Definitely in the awareness. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Someone else. I was having a hard time with this meditation because um, I, I don't know if I'd label it hard, but I can't distinguish between what you're calling mindfulness of the mind versus emotion or thought. Great. So, so I, I'll answer that question first, and then I'll make a comment about maybe your meditation. Um, there, there, there's a big overlap between them. But the difference is that uh, there can be an emotion, uh, a response, emotional response, that um, is a particular detail within a bigger environment. It doesn't have to color you know, how we are. So the grumpy person walking down the street might see uh, someone in distress, and in that moment of seeing the person in distress might actually be kind and helpful but their overall grumpiness is still intact. Or someone might be quite happy and carefree and kind of you know, very feeling very expansive walking down the street, and then um, you know, they see uh, someone throw some, or spit, you know, sp or, you know a big wad of spit, you know, you know, right onto the, the crosswalk button, you know. <laughs> 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 you know, where they're about to push. <laughs> And, uh, and so they still stay pretty expansive, but for a moment there's this like irritation or this annoyance kind of bubbles up. But the annoyance is like a little piece of who they are as opposed to defining who they are. So an emotion can be uh, a subset or a small part, whereas a state or a mood is the overall, overall gestalt. Does that make sense? A little bit, yeah. A little bit. So... So it's possible to have anger as a particular factor of the mind, particular functioning of the mind, and it's possible to have anger as the overall atmosphere for our mind as well. But but uh, and it, it doesn't have to. The anger doesn't have to affect the attitude or the, the atmosphere. So that's the difference. So there's overlap there. Now a comment about your meditation. You said you found this hard. So, um, so the, your attitude that you would have were, were supposed to pay attention to then was, this is hard. I'm having a difficult time here. I'm struggling with this. Did you note that? Did you notice that? Um, actually, I think hard was a label I was putting on it after the fact. Oh. I mean, during the experience itself, I was aware that <clears throat> I've been in a problem-solving pattern of thought all day yeah. and I was still in that problem solving pattern of thought ah, so and, that it, and that's what I became aware of and becoming aware, becoming aware of it was pleasant um, you know use the same word so but I couldn't connect this experience with 
what you said before and what you were trying to okay. to teach. Okay. Yeah, because it's not so that easy to understand. Not that easy for me to explain. Um, so that was, but still, so so you noticed that you were kind of kind of the I don't know if it's the overall mood, but the overall kind of momentum of the thinking mind was problem solving, and noticing that was pleasant, like this woman here said, and um, and uh, what was it like in and of itself to be involved in that problem solving? Was that pleasant itself, or? Um. No, um, no, it, it wasn't pleasant or unpleasant actually, but it definitely singular and uh, narrow-minded. So narrow-minded. So you could feel you could feel that somehow the, the your mood or attitude, or overall kind of way of being, was kind of narrowed, and it was more pleasant to be aware. And then in the state of awareness, were you a little more expansive? Yeah. So that's that's you know, that's what you're noticing. Noticing that difference, and if you notice that difference. Uh, see, noticing differences is very helpful for the inner life or the mind. Because as we notice differences, uh, almost naturally we can choose to go in directions that are healthy and helpful for us. So if you know, oh, there's a difference here between being narrowed down versus being expansive, the difference between being caught up in something that's unpleasant and a way of being aware that it's pleasant, then I think it's almost like a natural thing to kind of go towards that which is more helpful or, you know, so the more distinctions we can make, uh, the more we can move towards uh, health and freedom. Someone else? Yes. Uh, just uh, one thing that, I, that was really powerful for me was something you meant, er, mentioned early on was the concept of choice and that we have choices. Um, and what I find, the, 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 the mood or the attitude that was coming up for me, which is something that, that is not new for me, is kind of just a general tiredness. And I find that it's not perpetual, but there are certain times of certain days where I can just tell, all right, I'm in, I'm in that mood. Um, in fact, as a, someone who's not a morning person, it's often in the morning. Yeah. And sometimes it's, it's in the evening, like, like tonight. Um, and that's something I've always been aware of, but sometimes when I'm in that mode, it just seems to take over and uh, and just reminding myself that what I, kn- I know when I'm in that mode and I'm very aware of it but suddenly realizing that oh I also still have choices about what actions I take when I'm in that space I think that was very powerful for me and I'll have to see how I can apply that in in day to day living after I leave tonight but for me just that, that reminder of oh I have choice that, was, that was powerful great and if you have choice you have more freedom So, um, okay, yes. I just have a quick question. So, um, d- does one have a choice, for example, to be angry or not? Mm. Um, sometimes you have a choice, and sometimes it doesn't seem like you have a choice. Sometimes it doesn't seem like you have a choice, but if you could be more mindful, you would see there is actually is a choice. Because, and sometimes it just, who knows why we're angry? You know, we, we, you know just, or, or maybe we had a choice that at the first moment, but we didn't see it. And now it's so powerful that it has to just play itself out. It has to, momentum has to un, unwind. So now that I'm angry, it's just there. Um, so it's an interesting question. Uh, I don't want to say that we always have choice about these things, but mindfulness shows us how we have more and more choice about things. And we have a lot more, most people have a lot more choice than they realize. There's a lot more more choice potentially available if we wake up more and see more clearly. When I was in my 20s, um, I was really really interested in um, when I felt attracted to some woman, I would fall in love periodically. And um, and I was got really interested to see um, uh, where the choice was, where the decision was to fall in love, and was there a decision? And I had to be very ac- attentive and very careful, because you know the assumption is you know just wow you know, it's chemistry I just <laughs> it just happened you know I'm just now in love you know and <laughs> and there's no choice it's just like that person is just so attractive. <laughs> 
but if I was really really paid a lot of attention, I could see that uh, there was uh, things like there's a certain degree of pleasure and satisfaction and feeling of something beautiful and nice or something I could see. And then there would be a choice in my mind. Oh, I want that. I want more of that. I want to be connected to that. And and that choice would then translate into what would eventually might be called, you know, falling in love. But there was a choice. If I was quiet enough or still enough or concentrated enough to see. Make sense? And love, falling in love, most people don't think it's a choice. They don't want it to be a choice. Because that's anyway. It's just the way that you, the way things should be. Until it's ours. <laughs> How did I do that? <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> I wish someone had showed me where the choice was. So, um, so, uh, just for a moment, if you will, please, could you close your eyes? Just as you are. Don't have to change your posture. And what would you say is your attitude right now? Doesn't have to be special or precise. What's the, the, what attitude is the one that's most operating for you right now? And then can you shift back and forth a few times between being the attitude, being in the attitude, believing the attitude on one hand, and then shifting to stepping out of the attitude and just being mindful of it, knowing it's there, being the watcher of it. And if you can do this, notice how different it feels to be kind of in the attitude, believing the attitude, versus stepping back from it and just seeing it there. Okay, can you uh, open your eyes? And were some of you able to shift back and forth between those two modes of being? Does that make sense to some, enough of some of you? So for those of you who it made sense for, can you uh, tell us a little bit what you noticed about the difference between being one way or the other? So here, Jill, over here, buddy. I think it goes back to something you mentioned before was that there's a there's a sense of detachment that I would say the the mood I was in was sort of receptive that's the way I, it was what? receptive receptive huh and then if I notice myself being receptive I'm detached from it which mm-hmm. maybe is not that insightful but then when I was able to step out of it when I'm receptive I'm like okay I want to kind of get information get knowledge get some insight and that felt pleasant to be in it and then out of it it's like okay well there's this sort of feeling, and it wasn't as pleasant because mm-hmm. I was just sort of observing it. Mm-hmm. But I think, and then, and then said, well, so I don't want to be away from being pleasant. You know, that was, that was nice. Why, you know, why, why would I want to detach myself from that? But then, of course, I was thinking what you said, I think it was, I don't know where it was, but that you don't just selectively detach yourself from the things that you like and then not detach, or, you know, you don't detach yourself from things you don't like and cling to things you do like. The idea is that you want to be able to right. move away from everything uh-huh. to some degree. Good, great. Yes. Yeah, so there's nothing wrong with having pleasure and being having pleasant. Nothing wrong being in receptive mode. But uh, when we meditate, what we're trying to do is not to be let, let linger, hold on to, or indulge in any particular thing. 
and you don't want to indulge or linger in that attitude of being receptive. It's good to be receptive, but if you're leaning into it, holding on to it, it's difficult to meditate. So the stepping back, and it doesn't have to go away, but you step back and be aware of it. And oddly enough, you're in some ways more receptive when you're in this kind of more mindful state, even though maybe in the short term it might feel less pleasant. You're not, you're not, you're not being soothed by it or something. Okay, thank you. Someone else? What I, I noticed a very similar sensation to that. Um, and when I stepped back, I actually felt like there was an energetic and color shift, if that makes sense. Like when I was, when I was there and being, um, you know, the feeling of openness and receptivity, it was, there was like clarity to it. When I stepped back and I was the watcher, it felt as though, I, I disassociated myself, and in, in that disassociation, the color changed, and I felt like a blueness. And I don't know if that makes sense, but that was my experience. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So some people are very visual, and some people experience things to col with color like that. Great. Thank you. I, unlike them, I was in. I discovered I was in kind of a depressed, slightly depressed mood when I, you know, checked in and, and found that I, which was kind of surprising. I didn't think I was, and it felt kind of heavy, and um, and kind of unpleasant. And then when I did the shift, immediately it was very light and airy, and I could kind of look at this kind of blob of depression kind of, you know, plotting on the floor or something, but I wasn't part of it, and I was much more, um, you know, just freed and, and uh, kind of that expansive, I guessness that you Great. were talking about. Beautiful. That was my experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very nice. I remember once when um, I was driving back down here from San Francisco in the evening, 10 o'clock in the evening or something, and I had a horrible headache. It was one of these headaches that was, you know, I felt I was nauseous, you know, really bad and um, I was driving down and, and I was so I was so miserable like this poor me and it was so hard I don't know can I make it I should maybe pull over I don't know I it's so, it's so far to drive and after a while I thought oh Gil <laughs> you teach mindfulness <laughs> <laughs> maybe you should try it <laughs> <laughs> So I, tr I start, so I started bringing my mindfulness to what was going on and just noting, you know, the pain and noticing my self-pity and, and uh, you know, and, you know the, all these things. And as I did that, uh, the pain didn't go away, but it became a lot easier to be with. And some of the nausea went away and, it, you know, I felt a lot better very quickly. And uh, it was quite dramatic in some ways. But then once I started feeling some distance or some freedom or some spaciousness around it all, then... Um, I got complacent and let my mindfulness kind of, kind of stop. <laughs> and then um, the pain was still there, so then, oh, poor Gil, it's hurt so much. I'm still nauseous. Oh, I've got to be mindful. <laughs> and then I pull up the mindfulness again, and, and then I could manage just fine. And it just, you know, so it, it was fun to watch this kind of movement of uh, losing my mindfulness and then bringing it back up. And, and the, you know, it, it was really consequential in that situation. Um, because I got home fine. Yes. So how do you know if you're disassociating or detaching? Mm, that's a good point. Disassociated or... What was it? Deta or detached, or we don't in Buddhist English we don't use the word detached. We, we use, use the word non-attached. Okay. 
um, I don't know exactly why, but detached has kind of a negative connotation, and uh, non-attached is not, it's not supposed to be negative connotation. I don't know what you feel, but um, and uh, and uh, disassociated means you're not connected to what's not going on. You're really separated from it, and um, and aloof and kind of kind of a, there's a wall between you and it. You're shut down somehow. Um, and uh, probably if you're dissociated, you're not connected to your body. You don't know what's going on here, probably. Not connected to your, your emotions. When you're mindful and, and not attached, there's this uh, dual thing goes on. And it's, it's a little bit hard in, you know, to, in, in, in language to describe this. But it's like two things are happening at once. Uh, one is that there's an increased intimacy and feeling of connection to what's happening. And at the same time, there's a feeling of being uh, independent of what we're connected to. So we're both we're really there, and we're also free of what's there. If you're too much the observer, too much step back, too far away, then we lose that sense of connection. But if we're too connected and involved, then there's no wisdom and understanding there. So as we get more less attached, less preoccupied, caught up by things, then uh, the way in which caught upness or attachment or clinging or agitation in the mind clouds our experience, separates us from experience, um, uh, squeezes the experience, uh, that all that kind of falls away. And then there's a clear perception, there's a clearer contact, there's a cleaner contact with what's going on. And that cleaner contact can feel quite intimate. But still, that that intimacy you feel also independent of what you're aware of, and so the sense of being an observer gives a sense of independence. So the both are kind of going on. Does that make sense? I know it's not. Yeah, and so um, yeah, so so um, so one of the one of the way one of the ways to um, so when we're mindful of something, we use the language sometimes of observing it, being observer of it, for example. But you don't want to be too much in the watching mode. You also want to feel the experience. And so actually there are some meditation teachers who will avoid the, the, any kind of language having to do with seeing. You know, watch your experience, observe your experience, because it, it lends itself to being separated from your experience in a way that sometimes is not so helpful. So they'll talk, use language instead of feel your experience, sense your experience, rest in the experience to bring that close together. But, it, but that language of resting or feeling or su- touching the experience sometimes doesn't allow people to be independent of it, kind of to see it in a greater clarity or be present in it. So, but if you're going to if you're going to err, if you're going to make if you're not going to, I would err on the side of feeling instead of seeing. We want to be connected to what's happening. So maybe one more over here in the corner. Um, Is it on now? This is only about the third time I've ever tried this, so I'm really new to it all. Um, but what I did notice is, like, the, I think one of the first times that I've ever felt this, I got this sense of um, a pleasant drift. It was like jumping into a great big feather bed on a, on a cold night and just getting real comfortable and cozy. But then I also noticed that... <laughs> as the half an hour or however long we were doing this went on, I realized I was probably really neurotic because my my mind, I, and I got a sense of what is reality because my mind was listening to you and I could address in my mind, oh, yeah, that's what I'm feeling. Oh, nope, that's what I'm feeling. I could always come up with a situation that would put me in the, 
am I feeling tired mode? Oh, yep, I'm tired now because I started with, oh, I, and I have no worries in the world. I'm, I'm exactly where I want to be in life. I'm very fortunate to have everything I have. And, and then all of a sudden, oh, yeah, I am tired when you <laughs> mentioned tired. And I could think of, and then, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm this, I'm that. Everything you said, I could, I could address a situation or a time or a thought that, so now I'm really confused. I can just be whatever it is. <laughs> so I, it's hard I, should, I should have ended really with ha- see who really I am. I should have ended. I should have ended with happy. <laughs> so the question is, who are you really, or is this confusing? Uh, or? What am I really feeling? <laughs> what am I what are really? You? What is my being, and am I being whatever is suggested? It might be. Uh, uh, I mean, especially if you were in a very relaxed, floating kind of mode, there can be uh, the power of suggestion can be much quite strong. And so just sometimes just name, saying a word can evoke almost that state sometimes in people. Or it might be that to all, of the, to all of the above, but you're selecting them out of your, the, the, the collection of things, these things as you hear the words. Because a person can be both tired and excited and, and happy and eager. and All those things can be true. And also, if I say the word eager that somehow triggers the eagerness. You know, it wasn't there before. And the suggestion kind of evokes it. And if you're more relaxed, some, some people are more uh, suggestible in a relaxed state. That's why, you know, in hypnosis, they use, you know, the power of suggestion is so strong. Um, uh, we're, we're in, in mindfulness meditation, we don't want to use suggestion to evoke anything. Uh, and this was just an exercise here, you know, to give you some sense. And it actually, this is the opposite of that. It's, the, it's the really a, a task of not evoking or suggesting anything or making something happen. It's more noticing what is happening. And so as you continue, you'll just notice what's happening, and I think you, it'll, it'll clarify, your, it'll become clearer and clearer for you, in a sense, who you are and what's going on. And it'll give you kind of a ballast or give you kind of a grounding or centering in the midst of maybe all the changes that go on in your life. The awareness will offer a kind of clarity or stability that lets you kind of not be swept away by things. Make, makes enough sense? Yes, thank you. So um, in terms of meditation practice, the overall uh, attitude or state of being that you have when you sit down to meditate will also affect your meditation and how it unfolds. It'll affect how you relate to the meditation. It'll affect how you, uh, what's going on for you as the meditation proceeds. And so if you don't pay attention, if you, don't know, if you sit down to meditate and you don't notice, oh, I'm grumpy, then that grumpiness can, kind of, can, can somehow keep affecting you as you go along and, and you know, derail you from your meditation. But if you notice, oh, I'm grumpy, then you take that into account, then you may be much more likely to notice how the mind drifts off into kind of grumpy kind of thoughts and catch it and come back. You might notice that how much the, um, your mood kind of affects what you want and how you respond to different things that happen as you meditate. So taking into account the overall state that you have while you meditate might actually make the meditation easier, even if the overall state might be unpleasant, because then you can, you can kind of factor that in and help you kind of stay on track. Make sense? Yes. Yes, that, you can do that. You could. You, so the question is, if you have an overall mood or overall state, do you just make room for it and feel it and sense it and label it just like you would for a particular emotion? Mm-hmm. Yes, you can do that. It's fascinating to do that, and especially if it's strong. Sometimes there's very strong states of mind or sta- states of consciousness or states of being that are so clearly there that you want to bring mindfulness to it. And uh, even if it's not that strong, sometimes it's useful just to explore it a little bit and hold it in awareness. And especially if you feel like it's influencing you a lot, then you want to stop and be present for it for a while and you know, feel it. Feel how big it is. You know, is it as big as, is it, does, it, does it feel like it's as big as your body? Or does it feel like... Sometimes certain states feel like they're actually bigger than your body. Yeah. Yeah. And you say, oh, look at that. Oh, it's... You know, I didn't realize I was that big. It's like, you know... Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so then you could then you can kind of feel the hugeness. How big is this? And kind of feel it out. And how dark can it really be? And just feel it and just be with it. And what happens when I feel the hugeness and the darkness? And can I just be present for that and see what happens? It's fun. It can be fun. So, um, so uh, what I was trying to, what I'm trying to convey today, mindfulness of the mind, attitude, mood that might be there. Um, I think it's a little bit hard to convey, and so some of you might be confused by this, might, or might not make a lot of sense. If that's the case. Uh, don't don't worry about it. Um, uh, and also, uh, uh, just to, to do the, to, to to just do the first week's instruction of coming back to your breath and being with your breath is enough for a year of meditation practice. It's just it's just just doing that is very significant, very helpful, and um, and exploring that first week's instructions as, as you go forward for a while might actually be better rather than racing through these you know six weeks the way we're doing. Or it might be that the first and second week is, you know, just doing that is enough. It's simple, it's straightforward. Being aware of the breath, being aware of the body, what goes on in the body, going back and forth, that's enough. So if you find that it's getting too complicated, all this, now you've got, boy, this Gil guy, he says, you know, breath, and then he says body, and then he says emotions, and then thoughts, and now this strange thing called attitude or the overall state. And there's so much to pay attention to here. I feel like I'm juggling while I'm meditating. How am, I, how, how am I ever going to get relaxed? <laughs> I can't even remember it all. What did he, you know? So if it's, it gets to be like that, then just forget it all and, uh, and go back and just do your breathing. And the breathing is the default. And just stay with your breathing, stay with your breathing until some of these other uh, realms or experiences become so glaringly obvious that it seems, oh, I better pay attention to this. So if emotion becomes so clear that it's like, well, I better, you know, then you can do this, what I'm talking about. But you don't have to kind of be wondering, where am I supposed to be now? Just go back to your breath. Be with your breath. Trust your breath. And it might be at some point, as you go along here, that uh, this instructions about the attitude or the overall atmosphere that or state of being that you are is helpful, becomes so glaringly present. One interesting place that becomes very present and, and uh, u- useful and important to notice is when your meditation gets really strong. Strong states of meditation uh, primarily are, are characterized by uh, radical or, or, or very strong changes in our overall mood, atmosphere, attitude, state of mind, state of being. And very, very radically different states of being than what we normally would be kind of walking down the street or going to work or something. And then you go, wow, it's a whole different state of being I'm in. Oh, Gil talked about that state of being. Okay, let me feel this. Let me, let me bring mindfulness to that and be t- attentive to that. And so then it might be obvious and useful. So I'm kind of laying out the kind of the instructions here. But you don't have to try to memorize it all or kind of you know second guess where you're supposed to be. Uh, if it's not obvious, then be with the breath. That make sense? That way it's really simple. It's supposed to be simple. If it's not simple, it's not mindfulness. If it's not simple, it's not mindfulness. So if you're saying, oh, what should I do next? And what's supposed to be a Am I supposed to be digging in here and looking more carefully? Am I supposed to be stepping back and looking at it? And am I supposed to be feeling it? You know, what's, you know, where am I? That's not simple. Okay. Oh, that's not simple. Okay, mindful. I'm, okay. Making things co- this complicated, complicated. Just notice how complicated they have made it. <laughs> Be very sim- very simply notice how complicated it's gotten, and then go back to the breathing, and be with the breath. Okay. A couple of things. Uh, so next week is our last week, and um, and um, and then the following week, we start here at IMC a four or five I think it's a five week series called the Beginners Practice Group. And it's kind of designed as a follow-up class for this class here. And uh, I mean, you don't have to come, but uh, those of you who want to have additional support for your meditation, you just started perhaps and you'd like to get more support and, and, uh, and for it, um, two very senior uh, students from IMC 
who uh, one of them, who's both of them, I think, have offered this. Um, one of them has offered a lot of these beginners practice groups. Um, are going to be here to um, do a little bit of teaching, do some meditation with you, and have a lot of time for discussion about this as well to support you as you explore this and try to understand all this. And um, um, it's very lovely. It's much more relaxed. Um, sometimes some people like it that it's senior students because it feels more a little bit more like peers and and uh, you know you can feel like you can explore and talk about things you know after all I'm so intimidating and you know and you know I'm going to put a platform and stuff so <laughs> <laughs> and um, and so it's uh, also it's also a chance to kind of hear other people's experiences a little bit more so it's been a lovely thing the beginners practice group so that starts in two weeks and. Um, I think that's maybe all for now. Okay. So um, thank you very much for today. And and um, let's see, next Wednesday is the 5th of November. <laughs> I wonder if... We'll see. We'll We'll see. You know, attitude, emotional state <laughs> might be very important to pay attention to in the next uh, week. <laughs> and uh, you, if you don't, you know, notice it and be mindful of it and be careful of your choices and <laughs> <laughs> what you say and what you do and what you check off. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then depending, you know, maybe, we'll see, but maybe um, we'll have to modify the last week's instructions depending on what you guys bring to the room. (laughs) We'll find out next week. Thank you.